Hello and welcome to Awake Ones. My name is Lorraine Flaherty. I'm Alexandra Winman. And t- today we're going to talk to you about this young lady's adventures because, as uh, you know, we've had a bit of time apart and uh, You've been off on the other side of the world, <laughs> literally, <laughs> literally about as far away as you can get. So you got to go home. I got to go home. You got to go home without me. I know. <laughs> this one was in India. I was so in India. She was in like, Australia. I know. And I talked about going to India. It was really weird. Yeah. At the beginning of the year, I'd spoken to our friend Lalamar about going out there, and then I didn't end up going. But then I ended up going. I ended up going. So it was almost like India was calling either of us to. Yeah, it's amazing. And then my brother was getting married, yeah. so I I went home. I went home for a month, and yeah, it was quite quite incredible. Normally, I go home around Christmas time every yeah. couple of years, but this time because it was November, it was a bit right. of a random time, yeah. and everyone was still working and getting on with their lives. So I kind of had time just to, I guess, walk around and soak up life in Australia and kind of wrap my mind about around what it would be like perhaps to live there again maybe one day and or at least just to see what daily yeah. life is like now because I've been gone for 20 years I've lived in London oh, nearly 20 years is a long time it's a long time and it, a lot has changed yeah a lot has changed I mean what what are the main things that you've noticed out there that are really different so it's really dualistic actually there's yeah. good and bad so one thing I uh, that really struck me is that the the light worker movement is really global it's amazing there is a global shift happening yeah. it's really noticeable you know everywhere yeah. you go there were people um, there are there are yoga centers right. there are there are people doing meditation it's becoming a lot more normal yeah uh, I had an amazing conversation with one of my best friends who I went to boarding school is a doctor and she's actually the head of uh, RPA hospital Right. in Sydney she's really uh, she's a rheumatologist Fantastic. and uh, every time I've gone home she and I have sat down and had chats and she's always kind of picked my brain about my therapy work and, and how it works and all of that but this time around I hadn't seen her in two years and this time around I could tell she'd gone away and done her homework right. and was starting to actually delve into the way that the mind and the emotions affect the physicality of the body and it, obviously immunology is kind of her remit right. so right. it's really interesting that she's uh, taking an interest in that so we talked about furthering that conversation and maybe and then since I've come back Lorraine and I've met another doctor a GP over yeah. here who's doing more functional medicine and stuff so really quite incredible so there's that side and then the other the flip side is that also I've noticed a, a very um, a strange influence creeping into Australia okay. it, it feels very Americanized now um, but what we've had we've had a change of um, prime minister so often the prime minister it okay. seems like there's one new one every six weeks so it feels a little bit destabilized okay. it's a lot more expensive than it was and it's a lot more aggressive than it was when I left it was this very friendly Aussie uh, yeah. mateship you always kind of, get the idea I, mean, I know yeah. the time that I've spent out there very it chilled out, very chilled out yeah. and back but it's almost like, you know, there's a lot of road rage, especially in Sydney that I noticed okay. there's a lot of road rage. There's a lot of this almost, and I love LA, but it feels like it's trying to be like LA or okay. it's trying to be like some big city. A lot of people very kind of look down at you know, their nose at you. And, and this was just a generalised impression. I mean, obviously there's still really good people yeah. there and very friendly people, but it was like you walk into a shop and it, and we used to be amazing customer service. Now it's either overkill or, you know, what are you doing here? One of the one of the places I really noticed this was this kind of juxtaposition was Byron Bay. And that's yeah. one of my favourite places to go. It was always, like, spiritual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I grew up in Coffs Harbour. Right. Byron's, like, three hours down the road. We used to spend our summers there. And it was this sleepy little hippie town, right. you know, like one main kind of street, a main beach. And now it feels like a suburb of Sydney. It's become expensive shops. I mean, I can't talk because I am wearing one of the best ethical <laughs> fashions. That will have favourite um, shop. Spell on the gypsy. But, yeah, it, it is. There's a lot of kind of... With this spiritual movement and this global movement that's going on, it's amazing. But there's yeah. a lot of people that are kind of following that because it's cool and it's a trend and delving right. into it at surface right. level. And I really notice there's a lot of this Lululemon wearing kind of yogis who are you know oh i'm doing this but i it's like are you walking your talk and i've noticed this almost false veneer slipping in and in byron it's really prevalent there's a really mixture of 
a really big mixture of energies there. And that said, you know, you've still got the, the, the locals that were always there, but the cars have changed, you know, it's not the old ute driving down the road anymore, you've got the Porsches and the Ferraris and the expensive big Range Rovers and stuff. But then you go out into the countryside and you've got, still got little towns like Mullumbimby and, right. you know, all these little other places like Lennox Head. And I loved it. I also got to kind of explore a little bit more of the countryside outside okay. of Sydney. So we, for the wedding, we went to the central coast um, around an area called Forester's Beach in Terrigal. And we stayed in a house overlooking the ocean there, which right. was, you know paid a bit extra for it but it was really worth it but while I was there I really wanted to connect to our indigenous culture and the real Australia and even though to my knowledge I don't have any indigenous heritage um like we're like convict heritage right but I've always felt you know I've gone around the world learning about different spiritual cultures and and different indigenous cultures and you know with the work we do obviously we we want to get to the truth of a situation um, so while I was there, I, I decided to see if I could do a, like a, an Aboriginal tour of some sacred right. sites and Tony, my husband and I went to the Hunter Valley, uh, the wine region and stayed in this gorgeous little cottage overnight. And we went around some of the wineries yeah. on the first day, but the second day I was like, right, let's go to the national park. And we ended up finding uh, a lookout which overlooks a mountain called Mount Yango. And Mount Yango is as important to the Central Coast people as Uluru is to the okay. desert people. So yeah. it's said to be the, the starting point for creation. Yeah. And the creation story that they tell is really quite phenomenal. So they talk about this this sky man, this man from the sky called right. Biami, coming down from the sky, landing on Mount Yango, taking a, a wife from the earth and um, co-creating with this wife and then he leaves and goes back to the stars Mm. so a little bit like some of the ascension kind of stories and the Pleiadian kind of stories kicking around I was like that's really interesting and then we found these um, incredible ancient petroglyphs carved into the rock and one of them is of Biami, and he, it looks like a spaceman. Like you're literally looking at someone who is, he, he doesn't look human. The right. shape of his head and everything is incredible. And he's wearing a belt, and the Aborigines have this this hair belt that the mother will knit for the son as he goes right. off on his initiation. So it's made from her hair, and it's oh. called the initiation belt. Now, similar to Egypt, they talk about Biami, as being the three stars of Orion's belt, as he's a, he's Orion, so the Orion's belt okay. is his initiation belt. Ah. So similar um, stories crossing yeah. between yeah. Uh, Australia and Egypt. So that was great, and to get to Mount Yango. So by the time we'd been there on our own, we just got guided. We didn't know where we were going. We were like thinking we'd go check out some other wineries, and as we're driving down the road. Um, We've kind of seen this sign for the National Park, which is Yango National Park. And Tony was like, oh, should we drive up there? It's so all dirt road. We passed all cyclists and hikers, but we drove all the way to the top. We're like, ah. I was like looking out for koalas the whole way up. Um, so it was great that we'd seen that bit because then we drove to the central coast and that's where we met this lovely guy called Tim at Giri Gira Tours. And Tim is... Um, He's, his mother is Aboriginal okay. and his father was white. And Tim uh, spoke to us about the fact that, I mean, even as recent as this, this guy was a product of an attempt to breed out right. the Aboriginal right. culture. So this is the sad part of it. Um, I learned a lot about how much trauma these people are in. And, you know, you it's not like where you go to a, uh, you go to Peru and you want to learn about shamanism and there's a shaman on every corner. Right. It's not like um, how kind of accessible other indigenous cultures yeah. teachings are to white people and to people on a spiritual path. They very much keep their their teachings to themselves. It's very tribal and it's very protected because they've been so taken advantage of. Right. And I think now there's so many people like on this bandwagon too that might take their knowledge and misuse yeah. it, that they, they keep it protected. But Tim was just absolutely gorgeous. It ended up just being me and my husband spending the day with him. And we booked like a two and a half hour tour right. 
and we ended up spending about five or six hours with this man and mm. it was like meeting an old friend yeah so he opened up to us and he actually in the end treated us to a traditional smoking ceremony amazing. which was amazing so he he lit a, a fire and they use um red gum eucalyptus red okay. gum and the idea is that the spirit of the gum will cleanse you of any uh, um impurities and anything you want to let go of yeah. or get rid of and it was so funny uh, tony ended up with a really horrific cold <laughs> like that started the day after we did the cleansing <laughs> But it's known as a welcome to country ceremony. Mm. So it felt really significant to me in that even though I grew up in Australia for the first 22 years of my life and I've nearly been in England for oh, half my that, life, yeah. it felt like a welcoming back but a welcoming to the spirit of the country, yeah. not just yeah. to the country. Because so you'd be a very different person to the one that you were left. Absolutely. Yeah, there's more of an honouring and, yeah. and a connection with Mother Earth and you know, I, I have a phobia of spiders and stuff. Like, I've become so anglified. But he had me. My shoes were off. I was barefoot on the earth. Right. We had to, you know, tread softly but firmly because at any moment we could have come across a king brown snake. We were in the middle of the bush, right? right. But he took us and showed us more ancient petroglyphs. And it, and it was amazing. He, he said the synchronicity of us going to Mount Yango first right. wasn't lost on him because that was part of the same song line that linked up with those petroglyphs in Budai National right. Park where we were with him. So he took us to see these beautiful, he called them grandmother trees. Yeah. And it was where the, the women's business was done. It was right. the secret women's business circle. And they'd actually take the tree as a sapling, tie a loop in it, and when the tree grows big, there's actually a, a hole in it that's meant to represent creation or something yeah. like that. And we had, um, I noticed sap on this tree. And these trees are really fluid, like gnarly looking yeah. feminine kind of trees that are in this location. And I said, oh, there's sap here. And he went, oh, take a bit, put it in your mouth. And he said, that's a natural painkiller, that sap. And they used it in childbirth wow. and everything. So I was learning a little bit about sacred women's business yeah. from him. And, uh, yeah, so he was amazing. And, and we ended up taking him for lunch. And I'm sure he and I will we'll stay in touch. And yeah. I think there's more that I could learn from him. And I, I actually think that he piqued Tony's interest as well. And Excellent. he was like, I really want to take you for a beer, Tony. It's <laughs> like, I want to know more about Spiritual your... beer. Spiritual beer. Spiritual beer. But about, I remembered about um, two or three years ago when I was in Ibiza and I was doing some shamanic womb yeah. work in Ibiza, I had a vision of an Aboriginal woman uh, in Australia that I w felt I was going to meet. It wasn't a past life vision. It felt like someone I was going to be connected with in the future. I didn't get her name, but I could see her face really right. clearly. And on the day that I met Tim, I had this vision of this woman again, but this time she looked more like she'd slight red in her hair and she'd cut a fringe in, right? Didn't think anything of it. I was like, oh, well, maybe I'm going to meet her. I asked him if he knew anyone of that description, right. and he was like about 20 people. <laughs> so I was like, okay, whatever. But I kept seeing this woman. Anyway, we went to the wedding, which was beautiful, and then we um, we drove up the coast to stay with my dad in my family house in Coffs, and then we went up to Byron Bay for a couple of days. And while we were in Byron, I, was, I said to Tony, I'm going to see if we can do something similar in Byron and meet up with an right. Aboriginal um, elder or teacher and see if they can teach us about some of the song lines in that area. So I go on, I'm just Googling, and I found this woman. Her face popped up on my thing, and I was like, oh, my God, that's her. And I found this woman, Lois Cook, who's right. a local um, Aboriginal elder, and she was amazing. And, again, we met her, booked a tour, um, and she took us out for this whole day Brilliant. and told us. I mean, she's amazing. She's an activist and a teacher right. and an artist and... Um, her knowledge is incredible. She knows the law inside out. She can yeah. quote like article two of such and such and such and because she knows about her people's rights mm. and how little of their rights that they have. And she, again, like completely opened up to us and it was yeah. just myself and Tony. And she talked to me a lot about the, the spiritual side. She took us to some ancient sacred fertility sites to yeah. like Lake Ainsworth, which is a tea tree stained lake. And it's the cool. water is actually goldy red from the tea tree. Wow. She made us a kangaroo lunch. She was teaching us about bush tucker. Okay. Um, it was really amazing. But it, it, it kind of it surprised me, but it didn't. In that, you know... It, it makes me a little bit sad to go back to Australia and see how 
little respect and regard mm. we have for our Indigenous people and to talk about, like, our government, it, it, to me, it, they feel like they're just little boys playing games. They don't really know. And I feel like they need to be actually asking for guidance from our Indigenous yeah. people, not telling them how to live their life, not not that way around. Yeah. There's not enough respect. Because they've been working with the land oh my God. since the beginning of time, there's, haven't they? I mean, there's working, living so evidence going land. back. I mean you know their stories they they, they yeah. know their history goes back longer than we even think yeah. it goes back longer than uh, further back than we think there were people on this planet right yeah. I mean there's evidence of Aboriginal people being in Australia more than 75,000 years ago yeah. uh, we talk about 45,000 years but it goes back even further than that and they have stories that go even beyond yeah. that um, and obviously you can't date rock so the petroglyphs that we're looking at are so ancient and we know that a lot of them came down they have links to africa they had links to indonesia there were when the when the land was whole and lois was talking to me so interestingly about these stories of egyptian links right that they, they have a story of a female egyptian pharaoh that when the when it, the land was all connected, when it was like a land bridge, it was a female um, ruler came to Australia and took uh, an Aboriginal husband, and she said, "I don't know wh- which temple it's in. I don't know. I've not heard this story before, but right. apparently it's one of the verbal stories. Be yeah. interesting to find out. Very interesting. Because um, I was like, wow, tell me more. I haven't heard this, and my brain's kind of going. Yeah. It? But if it was all connected, it makes of sense. Yeah. And from what we know, there was you know people in these civilizations further back than we think but she said there is one of the temples in egypt as a actual um hieroglyph of a magic man and she said he's the aboriginal magic man that they know about so really interesting um we'll have to research that we'll have to research it but after i saw in the central coast after i saw the the story of biami and the spaceman tim said to me if you go further into the um, into the bushland where no one really goes. With to- it's right off the track. It's yeah. right hidden. There's so many of these petroglyphs that, you know, if it was somewhere else in the world, they'd be cordoned off. They'd be, you know, but no. the Aboriginal people don't want that to happen to their sacred sites because they're interactive, right? They're meant yeah. to be used. What you have is the petroglyphs were carved, but then you have the, the people come for ceremony and sit and tell the stories and rework the petroglyphs as they tell the story. So it's like living um, living sacred sites yeah. still. The, yeah. the tradition, the thread, it's in, and, the, and the love into the land right. is embedded more and, and more. So they don't actually have any temples as such, do they? No. It's just wherever the land, it, the, it's the yeah. land itself that's sacred. And they own nothing. Like they'd leave, they if they made a bowl or something to eat with or whatever they would leave that behind for the next right. person to come along they, they take no more than they need and they give back to the earth and very yeah, nomadic they walk softly that. softly on the earth yeah. and really connect to mother but he was telling me about this story and the petroglyphs that they found that they now know is the story of the Pleiades he said he sat me down and he went so you'll be interested in this <laughs> and he kept saying he kept looking at my husband and going this one she's from the stars he's like you'll get this star sister he's like oh i'm of the earth i'm a man of the earth but you come from the stars and he was going so we have this story carved into the petroglyphs which is about this you know these other brothers yeah. and sisters from this other um yeah galaxy and he said it, it's when you read about the Pleiades it's the same yeah it's the, the same, same story carved there into the rock so it was fascinating it, it was a fascinating trip home I felt like I really I felt like I connected to that land yeah on such a deep level but it, it also did make me really sad because one of the things Lois told me and I haven't gone to check this actually but it'd be interesting I mean I don't I'm, I should know more about um the law and about what goes on on this planet but she said that even though Australia was there to witness um, the global signing of the um, human rights charter Mm. apparently we're not actually part of it when we didn't actually sign it how bizarre which in this day and age feels pretty horrific really when you think about you know that there's not actually any accountability there on how my country treats people you know, and I say my country, I'm also a, a British citizen, so I'm a dual citizen now. Yeah. But, but yeah, so there's a lot of work to do there, but you see people all the time. There are more and more people who are now interested in taking up the cause. Um, right. 
Yeah, but very sad. I mean, when you think about the the convicts, I uh, I had a past life that you and I have talked about mm. in the Hawkesbury River region, which is around the central coast where I went to visit, um, which was a memory of being a, an Aboriginal woman, yeah. very pregnant and set upon by some settlers, and my baby was killed and I was badly wounded, and my tribe kind of mended me and I became a healer. When I got to that area, there was all this emotion and um, I hadn't known that history. They don't teach you the history of the massacres that went on there. And the year that I got was 1794. I'll never forget it. And anyway, I told Tim about it and he went, yeah, it checks out because they had passed a law at that time where they could actually cull the Aboriginal people like vermin. Um, and there were, because there was a... When Captain Cook set sail, it was like, if, the, if there's any land that is not occupied, yeah. you can take it for the Crown. But if the land is occupied, you can't. So what they would do is they would drive the Aboriginal people from their land or they would yeah. kill they them claim and it. hide the evidence so they could claim the land. And, you know, there's just not enough that's been done to make reparation. Mm. I know that it's generations ago, but really it wasn't. We've only occupied Australia for 200 years. I know. That's really recent, if you think of it in the grand, grand scheme of things. Only 200 years, and we've done more damage than up to 75,000 years yeah. of them living peacefully on that land. So oh, It's quite incredible, really, isn't it? Yeah. And especially when you think... I never quite understood the fact that the a punishment for crime was to be put on a ship mm. and sent halfway around the world to a place where the sun shines. I know. <laughs> and when there's like the good end of the stick, really. And there are beautiful pictures. Yeah. Like, hmm, hang on a minute. So who, who's getting them? Let's send them off to paradise. Yeah, send them to paradise, to this beautiful place. Although a lot of them probably died from, like, funnel web um, bites. And <laughs> I'm sure the journey out there didn't do yeah. well for most people. But so, yeah, when you think about the, the, the roots of that country, mm -hmm. I mean, it is a bit of a, a mixed bag, isn't it? You and know, we were all criminals, so... <laughs> yeah, criminals that go out yeah. there and then take over when there's a whole, you know, group of people that are quite happily settled and, and living there, minding their own business, getting on with things, and then suddenly they're just, you know met with all of these random people that have been sent out there as a punishment yeah. so even that energetically it's the, the 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 root of it is it's going to be distorted isn't it yeah and i mean we brought they brought the white people brought the disease they brought smallpox yeah. and yeah all that. a lot of aboriginal people have um it's sad it's a bit like the native americans you know problems mm. with alcohol yeah. and drugs and stuff the young yeah. ones um and then you've got what you have historically is where the white people also turned the tribes against each other, so right. kept them fighting amongst themselves yeah, so they wouldn't be worried about the bigger problem of the, the conquering of the, the land. And it's still kind of there prevalent under the surface today. There are certain tribes moved into certain areas which right. historically weren't their tribal areas. And, like, it's really sad. It's like how the establishment work today, the planet wide, oh, right? Set them fighting amongst themselves, and then in we swoop. We'll take the oil, and we'll take this and that. And yeah, but so. I guess you know the beauty of it, because there's always dark and light. Is yeah. the fact that you know you do have access. You know, for those that are on the path, there are people out there that are still trying to live in accord with the land, and I think. Yeah. For anyone, that's the message, really, isn't it? It's about yeah. finding the sacred and trying to live a, a little bit more yeah. in the way that those people have been living. Only take what you need, and yeah. you know, it, it's not about. I mean, I, I find that idea of owning land. You know, I still struggle with it. It's like the land belongs to everybody. Mm. You know, this ownership and this desire for ownership of a piece of it and more and more of it. It's like you don't need that much. To actually survive and, and to be mm. happy and I think if the peoples of the world actually just lived that way mm. just have what you need and then share and share share yeah. whatever else be accommodating and exactly calm. but one of the one of the things that really stuck with me from meeting both of those mm. extraordinary people both Tim and Lois is that both of them said that they saw that the the western woman yeah that is on the path of light 
is going to come back to the old ways and is going to lead the charge of this change across the planet. Yeah. Both of them separately, and they, they say right. that their, their their elders talk about it too. Yeah. Um, and isn't that the same thing that the Dalai Lama, Dalai Lama said, said and so yeah. many have said? So. Yeah. I just it's it's made me hungry to learn more, but at the yeah. same time, there's a little part of me that kind of thinks, well, I'm not I'm not Aboriginal in this lifetime, and. Um, is it you know I don't am I worthy to kind of understand more of their ways and I don't want to kind of feel like I'm jumping on any kind of bandwagon and I I was kind of talking to Tim about it and he said look if you are meant to learn the 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 women's business put it out there and see what happens and you are a citizen of the earth yeah so you know we're all part of it and I think that's all it takes to be worthy of yeah, being on that yeah. path, just a commitment and a love yeah. for the earth, and that's, love that's and, and a curiosity to just to learn, we are just to learn all the different ways of all the different people yeah. on the planet, and yeah, and I feel like, well, you know, I left Australia when I was twenty one, twenty two years old, to go and explore the world, and it's interesting because this trip home has just shown me, well, there's a whole other part to even of that world. even of that yeah. world that I still need to explore and delve into so we shall see where the path leads awake woman australia on <laughs> our way <laughs> yeah so we'll be uh, you know awake ones to india awake ones to australia more tours to come possibly back to la again in february we'll keep you posted but yeah other than that it was great and i had some amazing ice cream as well so <laughs> So yeah, good day, mate. She did some good shopping as well. <laughs> yeah. <I did. laughs> so yeah, good day from Awake Ones down under. <laughs> <laughs>